Uh, later on this morning, we're going to get the latest official figures on how the economy is performing, which will be interesting to see. Steph is taking a look at what they could tell us. Morning. Yes, morning, Lou. Yeah, it's uh, interesting, isn't it, with everything going on at the moment, see what's happening with the economy. Morning, everyone. This week, uh, we'll be getting a better idea of how our economy is doing at the moment. Now, there's lots of ways to measure it. One way is to work out uh, by looking at all the goods and services we produce and then seeing whether they're, we're doing more of things or less. And it gives us a figure called gross domestic product. And that's the figure which will be coming out a bit later this morning. So what can we expect? Well, with me is Vicky Price, who's a board member at the Centre for Business and Economic Research. Thanks very much for joining us, Vicky. So how is the economy doing at the moment? Well, what we've seen is a slowdown. I think the figures today will uh, demonstrate that that's indeed the case. Uh, what's happening is the manufacturing output has been declining uh, in the last few months. Uh, if you look at the PMI, which is the uh, Purchasing Managers Index, in other words, the expectations of anyone who's buying uh, things or who's ordering things in the manufacturing sector, uh, what you see is a slowdown. You see export orders. Uh, in fact, quite flat. You see domestic economy itself uh, looking stagnant. And that is, of course, you know, the export side mainly because the world economy is slowing down as mm -hmm. well. But there has been a huge amount of uncertainty on the Brexit front, which has meant that uh, investment itself has been falling for the last few quarters. And that's a serious issue because, uh, you know, is that investment ever going to come back? And we'll hear, of course, a little bit more about the withdrawal agreement later on today. But I think businesses want a lot more certainty before they start investing again. Yeah, I mean, we've, on this programme, been talking to lots of businesses over, well, it's years now, isn't it, since the referendum. Um, but as you say, this investment's been held off. Could it be a case that once we find out more about what's going on, things will then start to pick up again, this investment will happen? I think there's going to be a certain amount of investment that will come back. But uh, I'm a bit worried about that because, of course, what we've seen happening as well is a lot of stockpiling because people started getting worried, particularly manufacturing companies, pharmaceutical companies and loads of others, uh, about what may happen if there is a no deal or if there is an extension and then again we won't know anything. Uh, in terms of where we might end up. Uh, so if there is a deal, uh, well, that stockpiling will get reversed. So for a while, uh, perversely, we may see a slowdown in the economy because everything they've got, they'll just be selling rather than uh, either producing more or thinking about investing more. So it's going to take a bit of time. And the real worry is that we're still not going to know what's going to happen in the end of a transition period. Uh, what type of trade arrangement are we going to have? Are we going to be permanently in the customs union? Are we likely to stay in the single market? What mm. sort of relationship with the EU are we going to have? And if businesses don't know that, and given that they've already been relocating up to a point, rethinking the supply chains, affecting quite a lot of small firms all around the country, uh, then I think the likelihood that there would be suddenly a serious sort of boost in investment is, is quite small. Yeah. Are there any positives from this? Because, I mean, for example, <coughs> jobs figures are still Indeed. quite good, aren't they? That's absolutely true. But, of course, the jobs figures are the opposite of the investment side. Uh, businesses have been meeting the demand by just hiring more people. It's very easy to hire and fire in this country. Uh, and they have not been investing. Uh, so it's been the opposite uh, impact, if you like, that has affected productivity very negatively. We have to be more competitive. We have to innovate. So, yes, any certainty will be good news. Um, mm. But there's still going to be concerns about what, where we might end up. So the economy is forecast not to do very well this year. With the, as we know, the Bank of England has uh, now uh, uh, reduced its forecast to just 1.2% uh, for this year. The OECD, the, the, the group of... Um, rich countries has reduced it to just 0.8%, even if we have a sort of benign exit, if you like, with investment still falling, possibly by over 2%. Anything could happen, of course, because yeah. sentiment could change overnight. And, yeah. and that will affect, I think, quite significantly what businesses decide to do in the future. Uh, and it's also important to say, with these figures, it, I mean, that's still growth. So it's not like oh, we're, yeah. going in, we're going backwards into recession, is it? We're still going to be growing, but just not as much as we would want. Yeah. I think if uh, there is no deal at the end, uh, we may well see recession in the short term. Uh, but if there is a deal uh, of any sort, or even if there is an extension, I think we're still going to see growth. And yeah. uh, we're not going to see as much growth as we would otherwise have seen. We've already lost a huge amount of that growth. That's been uh, an estimate both by the Bank of England and by other institutions too. So we're not growing as fast as we should have been. Yeah, and just quickly on government finances, because obviously we'll get the latest figures out from the Office of Budget Responsibility on Wednesday, amongst everything else going on. What are they likely to tell us? They're telling us, I think, already that uh, um, the Chancellor is able to collect a lot more revenue than he expected. So they're slightly better than they would otherwise have been, which suggests that there is a little bit more money to give to the economy and he's going to have to use it, actually. Yeah, interesting. Vicky, lovely to see you. Thank you very much for coming in to see us. Uh, that's
737, nearly a third of households say that streaming is their preferred choice for watching TV and films at home. It's probably not a big surprise, is it? Um, how much are our viewing habits changing? Steph is going to have a look. Morning. Yes, good morning. Yeah, it's an interesting one, this, isn't it? And, and I don't think people will be shocked that things are changing in terms of how it comes to us watching telly and films. Morning, everyone. Yeah, around 30% of households are streaming TV and films as opposed to watching the traditional way. Now, that figure doubles for 18 to 24-year-olds, unsurprisingly. So we asked these people about their viewing habits. I've got my Sky and normal BBC and the ITV channels, and that's as much as I do. I like that you can choose what you're going to watch and um, not sit through lots of adverts and, well, there are some, but um, generally the choice aspect. I think it's quite a good way to watch TV um, with the streaming, but, um, yeah, it's kind of a shame in a way because we used to be able to, I suppose, tune in for something at the same time each week or whatever it was. Well, with us now is Martin Whistler, who's a global lead in media and entertainment analyst at EY. Thanks very much for joining us. So, so I mean, it's not a shock, is it, that people are changing the way they're watching TV and films? What are your thoughts on it? Well, absolutely not. And um, we've done some research. 30% of people, as you say, are now streaming, and primarily streaming um, TV, and prog TV programs and films within the home. Um, that increases exponentially for younger audiences. But that doesn't necessarily mean the death of traditional television. We tend to think a little bit of this battle where winner takes all between the traditional channels like the BBC, ITV, 4 and 5, and the streaming services like Netflix and Amazon. But actually what we're seeing, although we're becoming a nation of streamers, we still very much enjoy watching a lot of the content from those traditional channels. So are we still watching television live? Is there much of that going on? There's an element of that taking place, and there'll always be an element of that taking place. There's content like news and sports and even reality television where you need to watch it in the moment. But as audiences, we like choice, we like variety, we like different options, and, and that means that we've got catch-up, we've got box sets, and that's really where streaming comes into its own. It's interesting because often I'll watch things on demand, and you then don't really know what channel things are on anymore, do you? Do, do you think that they're losing their identity a bit because we just, you know, use whatever TV service it, it, we have? It's absolutely a challenge. And in our survey, we found that about a quarter of people were really struggling with that. They didn't know where their content choices were. So if you think about the amount of devices we have access to, the amount of content services that we have access to, it's really hard to kind of keep track of that and keep following that. And I think that's a challenge for the industry to keep pace and yeah. come up with new ways of putting content in front of us. We've talked on this programme before about the amount of money, for example, Netflix is spending and... Recently, we had uh, the, the announcement from the BBC and ITV that they were bringing out their, their own subscription service, BritBox. What are your thoughts on all this? Is there a space for it? Is this a market that's becoming saturated? What do you think? Well, there's, there's, there's lots of different options. So <clears throat> we see that um, despite the huge amount of spending, we like big blockbuster content. We like big shows. But audiences also like variety as well. So it's not necessarily money takes, the winner takes all, depending upon how much you spend. We asked audiences about quality, and it was actually a lot of traditional channels came out top in terms of the ranking of quality. So we still like those kind of things. It doesn't necessarily need to be driven by the big budget expenditure yeah. and the big budget spending. And overall, are we watching more TV and films then? Overall, we are. We just love consuming content. As a, as a nation, British people love sitting down in front of their devices and watching the biggest shows, the biggest hits. So, yes, overall, we're watching more content, and yeah. I'm sure we'll continue to do so. Yeah, I definitely am. Martin, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate that. That's it for me for now. Uh, now, what do statisticians, I can hardly say it, I think are our most popular purchases, and how do they use them to calculate how prices are changing? Steph's here to have a look at what's going on and what yeah. we're buying. It's really interesting because it gives you a sense of what the popular trends are at the mm. moment with what we're buying. So what happens is the Office for National Statistics will look at all the different types of things we're buying, and then they'll try and put together what they call a basket of goods. So these are the things that they think your typical family are buying the most often or perhaps spending the most money on. Mm. And then they will look at how those prices change over time. So in total, you're talking about 180,000 different prices that they're collecting every month wow. from 140 locations around the UK. What's really interesting, though, is what gets taken out and put into the basket each time they review it. I love looking at the list of this. So added this year, we've got popcorn, right. smart speakers, 
baking trays. Baking trays because there's lots of popular cookery shows, so we're now yes, having I've, a go I've, I've bought, baking ourselves. I've bought most of them. I haven't got the smart speakers. Go on. Yep. Have you got a baking tray? Yep. yep, yep definitely bought one of those this year. Flavoured teas as well. They're definitely quite bought popular. Some of that, yeah. you, you can see in the supermarkets now there's a big display of flavoured teas. isn't there? Electric toothbrushes as well are in. But um, what's and been. And my, my favourite, peanut butter. Yes. Peanut butter is now Some in. Some people just hate that, don't they, Beth? I know, okay. you've, you've contributed to that. I've definitely... <laughs> now in the basket. But things that are taken out are quite interesting yep. too. So settees uh, have replaced sweets. So we're more likely to buy a sofa rather than a three-piece suite now. And space, presumably, as well. Yeah, now. exactly, people's, uh, side of people's houses. Crockery yep. sets have replaced by a dinner plate. We're more likely to buy individual plates right. rather than a full set. Um, stereo systems have now been replaced by portable speakers. So obviously most people buy them as portables. Washing powders dropped in favour of your tablets instead or the little capsule things. Uh, and dry dog food has been replaced by dog treats. So just gives you a sense of how things are changing with uh, the Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much.